Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Mythbusters, Uncovering Truths About Behavioral Health Crisis Care. My name is Miranda Green, and I'm a clinical consultant with TBD Solutions and a member of the Crisis Residential Association. Today's panel will be recorded, and the link to the recording as well as the slide deck will be made available to all registered participants. Details about how to obtain the recording and slides will be shared at the conclusion of the webinar. A bit of housekeeping for today. Attendee cameras and microphones are disabled for the duration of the webinar, but we do encourage you to engage within the chat feature. We'd love to hear where you're from, so feel free to test out the chat by typing your name and your location. We'll also be monitoring the Q&A. Any questions entered into the Q&A box rather than the chat will only be viewed by those involved in monitor monitoring, um, excuse me, moderating today's event. And now on to the good stuff. Today's panel is hosted by TBD Solutions. TBD Solutions is a Michigan-based behavioral health consulting organization. The company's core expertise represents a rich background in research, organizational leadership, healthcare policy analysis, strategic planning, process refinement, facilitation services, outcomes management systems, training, quality improvement, and technology-based analytic and visualization solutions. TBD Solutions has a unique specialty in crisis system design, development, and measurement. They're committed to collaborating with communities to identify and adapt to unique challenges, solving problems that will improve behavioral health services for persons served. We'd also like to give a very big thank you to those organizations who have supported today's event, such as Crisis Residential Association. The Crisis Residential Association exists to support the operational and clinical functions of crisis residential programs around the world. Rooted in values of empathy, recovery, and continuous improvement, the association seeks to connect providers with the best ideas in behavioral health treatment to transform the way people receive mental health care. We'd also like to give a big thank you to the National Organization of Crisis Organization Directors, or NASCAD. NASCAD is an organization for social service professionals serving as executive directors or program directors for crisis organizations. NASCAD's mission is to provide support and professional development for executive directors and program managers. They arrange trainings, promote professional development, serve as advocates, and provide other appropriate services. We also would like to extend a thank you to the American Association, Association of Suicidology. AAS exists to promote the understanding and prevention of suicide and support those who have been affected by it. AAS is an inclusive community that envisions a world where people know how to prevent suicide and find hope and healing. And finally, thank you to International Council for Helplines, which is formerly Contact USA. International Council for Helplines is a helpline membership organization with a mission to inspire, educate, and accredit helpline programs with op um, which offer support to individuals in crisis and emotional distress. Their vision is that anyone at any time has access to thriving, effective emotional support. ICH promotes unconditional regard for acceptance to all people. So thank you so much to those organizations for helping to make today possible. I'm now gonna turn it over to our moderator, Travis Atkinson. Travis has worked in the behavioral health field for the past 15 years. He's a fierce advocate for efficient, equitable, and cost-effective emergency psychiatric care. And he's part, he has partnered with providers and payers across the country to find meaningful solutions to some of healthcare's most challenging issues. Travis has sought out opportunities to infuse mental health treatment and music, bringing musical self-expression groups into psychiatric hospitals and crisis facilities. A native Michigander, he enjoys writing and performing music, coaching his daughter's basketball teams, attending concerts, and stacking pills in the original Nintendo's Dr. Mario. He's traveled to 47 of the 50 states and hopes to one day perfect the two-fingered whistle. Travis received his BS in psychology from the U of M and his MS in human services and counseling from National Louis University. He lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan with his wife and three daughters. Thank you, Miranda. Um, it's great to have everyone here. I just wanna try and resolve some things early on. Um, I think there's maybe some uh, some audio issues that a few people are having. Um, so I'm gonna type this into the chat and just find out if audio is in fact working. Um, and just wait a minute and make sure that we have some, confirmed some people that can, um, that can hear us before we get moving on to the rest of the presentation. Okay, I've got some positives, great. Oh, 
You know, I love that about the crisis uh, service community is that they're they're so affirming. I think even if it was bad, they would find a way to 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 say that it was uh, that things are going well. So good. Thank you everybody for using the 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 questions or the chat. Uh, to say that your audio is working. That's wonderful. Miranda, thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, we are uh, kind of on a journey together in this industry as we are trying to seek truth and trying to seek what's going to be the most helpful, the most helpful interventions uh, for people who are in their darkest moments, who are um, experiencing the worst day of their life, um, who are you know experiencing considerable um, struggle at times. And so I think we're all looking for what that answer is, what would be the most helpful way to to, to care for, treat for, listen to uh, someone who is uh, experiencing this type of crisis. Um, and we've been seekers collectively um, in, in this community or in this, um, this industry for a long time. Uh, we've, been, we've been searching for answers of how do we help someone who is experiencing the world in a very different way than I am or, or is, is really struggling um, with uh, survival and with, with thriving. Um, there's been a lot of, of opportunity uh, for learning and for additional education, especially in these last few years, um, uh, ways that uh, either communities or, or organizations have tried to communicate what they believe are the most helpful ways to serve people in crisis. Um, and, and these are just a few of the documents that have come out in the last 15 years or so to give us a sense of how to serve people, how to, how to help people who are in crisis. Um, but still we seek, we seek answers. We look for answers because we know a couple things. One is that um, as, a, as a collective group or as a collective industry in behavioral health and emergency psychiatric care, crisis services, whatever you wanna call it, um, we've made mistakes before. We haven't quite served people how we wanted to, um, and 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 we have to constantly ask ourselves if we're doing it right. The other thing is, as as just a human condition, we're often um, attracted to the shiny object, to the thing that looks different than what we've done before, and might provide some promise or some solution um, in ways that we haven't had uh, in the past. And so. We have to check ourselves and be aware of our um, uh, our, our tendencies, our proclivities for acting in a certain way or trying to be helpful, but maybe not always getting there. So today's panel webinar is really intended to um, provide an approach that balances two things. Practice-based evidence, the experience of local crisis providers across the country, um, and evidence-based practice. You know, what does the research tell us about what has been the most helpful um, intervention or uh, treatment approach that's truly helped people in crisis. Um, and sometimes those, those old answers, if you will, you know, those, um, uh, those what, what might seem like a relic, um, it, it looks very similar to what we've talked about today. It's just a, it's just a, a new spin um, on an old or well-tested idea that just hasn't had a lot of, of promotion or a lot of awareness around it. So um, I wanna talk a little bit today about the, the services that we're gonna be focused on. Um, and then we, I will introduce our panelists and, um, and we will, uh, we'll, we'll have what hopefully is a meaningful discussion for everyone. You know, sometimes I get excited about animations and then sometimes they don't, they don't, they don't serve me well when I forget how much I've animated. So excuse me for just a moment as I get out everything on the screen here. We're gonna be talking about four service types today. We're gonna to talk about crisis call centers. We're gonna talk about mobile crisis teams, crisis residential programs and peer respite facilities. Um, to, so just so that we're all speaking the same language because that can be a challenge um, in our industry. Uh, is what what is what does this person mean when they say this word? Because for for me, you know, my state might say something very different. Uh, crisis call centers are operated 24/7. Uh, there are trained kinds of crisis counselors who are answering these calls, and that could be trained volunteers, clinicians, peer supports, um, you know, bachelor's level uh, staff, people with high school diplomas who have gone through extensive levels of training uh, to funk to work in this capacity. 
The goal is to de-escalate the crisis and divert people from other levels of crisis services when possible. The next level of care that we'll be talking about is uh, mobile crisis teams. So these are teams of clinical professionals responding to people who are in a crisis, uh, usually two people that are going out into the community at a time. And the goal is to de-escalate people uh, from that crisis and be able to divert them from, let's say, an emergency department visit or even a psychiatric hospital visit if they don't absolutely need that level of intervention. The third is, is crisis residential. This is an unlocked facility uh, that takes place in a home or in a home-like setting. The goal is comprehensive treatment within uh, with, excuse me, with diversion or step down from psychiatric hospitalization. And the length of stay is about three to 14 days. Um, you might see some variants in places like California, which get closer to a 20 or 28 day length of stay, but most uh, experience a three to 14 day length of stay. And then the last is pure respite. So these are unlocked facilities uh, taking place in a home environment, not really a home-like setting, truly inside of a home in a neighborhood. They're entirely operated or staffed by persons with lived experience, and the goal is to serve people in emotional distress or crisis. Um, the, the length of stay is usually three to 10 days, and this is it's very important that this part of the, the service is, is voluntary and it's non-coercive. People are actively choosing to participate in this service. So if we look at the, the, um, the amount of services uh, that that exist in the United States, or these types of services, I should say. Um, our key here is that each little icon you see is gonna be is gonna count as 100 uh, of these services. So crisis call centers, there are 800 crisis call centers in the United States. There are a, about 800 crisis residential programs in the United States. We estimate that there are about 500 mobile crisis teams. There are about 175 23 hour crisis stabilization units. These could also be called like psychiatric urgent care centers. Um, uh, there's a number of names that these can go by. And then lastly, the peer respite programs, there are about 70 in the US. So this gives you an idea of not just the types of services that we're gonna be discussing um, today, um, but also, um, uh, you know, a little bit of, uh, of detail on how how prominent these services are in the community. So here are our panelists for today. I'm very excited. These are uh, wonderful um, uh, examples of excellence in the crisis service continuum, and I'm uh, thrilled to um, introduce you to them. Uh, first is Steve Michio. Steve is the executive director of People USA in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, Steve has developed uh, peer respite programs in many parts of New York and consulted with other states and uh, countries in developing their peer respite programs. The second is Laura Mayer. Laura is the director of the PRS Crisis Link Program located in the DC metro area, answering the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Hotline and Chat. Uh, Laura's background in public health and social work brings both a clinical and upstream prevention perspective to crisis intervention. The PRS Crisis Link team operates 100% virtual since the COVID pandemic and has grown over 200% in the past two years, handling over 112,000 crisis contacts annually. And last is Chris Thompson. Uh, Chris Thompson is passionate about partnering with community members to reduce barriers that limit access to help including discrimination and prejudice and providing life-saving resources that can bring healing and improve quality of life. Uh, Chris has served uh, at Lenape Valley Foundation and has been working in the field for almost 20 years and has spent the last 12 years building crisis services. Um, he was also one of the chairs of the Bucks County Suicide Prevention Task Force. So I would invite our panelists now to unmute and show your videos and uh, welcome Steve and Laura and Chris. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. Great. Um, so Laura, I'm actually gonna start with you. I'd love to hear, um, I've got a map here uh, of where uh, y'all's programs are, are roughly located, but um, I would love to hear from you and answering this first question, these first two questions, I should say. What crisis services does PRS Crisis Link provide and what type of risk do you manage um, in your crisis call center? Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, so PRS Crisis Link is located in the DC metro area and we are 
providing hotline, text line, and chat services um, both locally to Virginia and then nationally as a national backup center and a core chat center for the suicide prevention lifeline. So um, our primary service is kind of the access point of the phone, text, or chat, and we provide that 24-7 except for chat. Chat we only do overnight. <laughs> That's enough. Um, but our service area is, is large because in Virginia and the area that we're in, it's roughly 2.2 million people kind of concentrated right on outside of DC and then the state you know is over 8 million people that we're also providing service to so we don't have a small service area um, and that's what makes our service delivery really challenging because every situation deals with a ju different jurisdiction and we expand that to national coverage um, just to kind of briefly describe that um, Essentially, if somebody dials the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, that crisis center that they call or they're closest to is busy and can't answer, the call is going to route to a national backup center so that it's answered more quickly. And so we are one of those centers providing that coverage. As far as the risk that we manage, you know, we use a blended staff model. So we have um, paid crisis counselors and we have volunteer crisis counselors. Um, and we follow imminent risk policy. So the policy is designated by the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, where we, be when we believe there's a close temporal connection between the person's risk um, and behaviors around suicide um, and imminent death or injury, we're gonna act, but within the least intrusive intervention possible. So our counselors are trained through ASSIST, um, applied suicide intervention skills training, which is evidence-based, as well as the Lifeline Safety Assessment Model. So for us, we're less focused on risk and more focused on how capable a person is for safety, which is a very different perspective because we everyone's at risk. So we want to look at the capability of that individual um, to remain safe and in their community. If it exceeds that their, their capability for safety, we engage in least intrusive intervention. That means we're going to look for mobile crisis, we're going to look for crisis stabilization, we're going to look for whatever that community's uh, resources are before we ever escalate to law enforcement, because that should be our last possible intervention if there is nothing else available. And so our counselors are not clinicians. We don't want them to be clinicians. We want them to be people with lived experience, people who want to learn, people who want to connect, and we want them to represent the community that we serve. So it's a little bit of a different hybrid model. Um, we expect that will change as crisis systems evolve in our state where service level determination is necessary. Clinicians will be need to, to be on staff, but we maintain the volunteer um, and kind of paraprofessional crisis counselors um, in our services. So it's a lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Great. <laughs> no, I, I, and I want to come back to um, what you said about kind of the intentionality of, of you know, who works in your center and your trust in their abilities to do what they do. I think that's that's um, that, that, that's important. Uh, and and we're we're probably going to talk about workforce um, a little bit later. But um, you know, we we. It, it, if if crisis services are expanding, which which we think that they're going to be, um, there aren't just clinicians. There aren't enough clinicians to to answer answer the literal calls or the figures of answer the call right. um, of these of these um, requests. And so we have to activate the abilities or the potential of our community and their ability to be empathic and helpful and and to do that in a safe manner in which they're trained. So um, great, thank you for for kicking us off, Laura. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go over to uh, Steve next. Steve, tell us about uh, People USA. Okay, hi everyone. Um, People USA is a, uh, a peer-run organization. Uh, we started out very small, about um, over 30 years ago, and have grown to provide a, a host of services. And as you can see here, uh, we do have uh, the respites we call rose houses, um, and we have we are. Um, probably one of the first, maybe only, peer-run crisis stabilization centers uh, in the U.S. right now, um, which is kind of a cool thing. Uh, we do have forensic mobile crisis and response teams in uh, uh, the county in Westchester, New York. Um, we serve nine counties, just so folks know. So uh, the populations range from 60,000 in one county up to about a million in a different, you know, another county. So 
overall we're serving uh, a population of a little over 2 million with all the counties uh, when you include them all. Um, we are part of Project HOPE, which is a COVID response um, uh, re outreach uh, teams that I have going out and just talking to people and saying, how are you? And, you know, how, how are things going for you? And getting them into services if they need it. Integrated peer services and everything we do, we're, we're involved in a lot of different uh, organizations, other organizations where my staff are helping people navigate those systems of care uh, right with, you know, within those organizations, including emergency rooms uh, and hospitals. Uh, we have 24-7 warm lines for folks, which are really support lines for people that are maybe heading towards crisis, but not there. Um, we are opening a medically supervised inpatient detox. Now, we've, we've always been a peer-run organization, and uh, for the most part, we still have even clinicians in the organization um, are, are peers uh, as well. Um, so we're maintaining that, but I think when we get into the medically supervised, we're going to be hiring some medical staff, which could be peers as well, but I just, we're, we're moving into a, a kind of a mixed uh, population of folks. Uh, we have recovery centers, we do employment benefits, transitional care, wellness teams, uh, mobile outreach, engagement centers, peer advocacy, which is what we originally were, which is a peer advocate organization. Uh, we decided to get into services years ago because uh, it's easy to criticize the service system, but when you actually get involved and start doing the work, you realize the challenges and the successes you can have in doing that. And uh, we focus more on the successes of what we've been able to do over the years in in, uh, in care for our communities. Um, so, in in a just in a real short nut, you know, a, a kind of a nugget for you. Uh, we as a peer run organization have done incredible work. I'm really proud of my teams uh, that are out there doing the work they do and really shifting the paradigm uh, and the integrity of peer services in our communities. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, I'm gonna move over to Chris now. Chris, tell us a little bit about Lenape Valley Foundation. Sure. So Lenape Valley Foundation is a moderately sized uh, community-based behavioral health uh, provider in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, Bucks County has roughly a population of uh, 600,000 individuals. Um, it's an interesting county in that when you get to the southern part of the county, it's very much metro, suburban, um, right outside of Philadelphia. But as you add run north in the county, it becomes very rural. Um, and, and, you know, from a mobile crisis standpoint, that can pose its own challenges with travel and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but Lenape Valley Foundation provides outpatient care, um, early intervention. Um, some of our youngest clients have been um, most recently a 16-day-old uh, child. Um, and we serve, you know, those who are, are in their hundreds, you know. So we, we cover the gamut. We have an assertive um, community treatment team or ACT team um, blended case management supports coordination for the ID population. Um, so we, we have a lot of um, community-based services that can serve all populations here in Bucks County. Um, if you could just advance forward, we'll talk a little bit more about crisis specifically. Um, <clears throat> so we, we do provide mobile crisis to the whole county. Um, initially, we started out just providing mobile crisis to the adult population and another provider was was handling children. Um, but in the last two years, we've combined that and now we provide service to the entire county regardless of age. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, we have different times when our teams are, are functioning in the in the, uh, in the community. Um, obviously, the, the latest development in the last year is the embracing of Zoom and telehealth interventions even in our mobile crisis team. And we have found that um, that has been a very positive um, um, facet to have within our mobile crisis team and the community enjoys it. You know, it's really impacted our engagement times and we're able to connect with families right away. Um, so that, that's been really important and I hope that's here to stay. Um, and then the next slide, Travis. We also have site-based crisis centers. Um, we are embedded in Bucks County in a couple of our emergency rooms. We have offices kind of off from the emergency room. Um, and, you know, within each hospital, it's a little different in the way we function. Um, and then, of course, one of our uh, um, 
because it providers, Penn Foundation uh, does provide crisis intervention services in the northern part of the county. Um, but I do want to talk specifically about crisis residential. Um, in 2019, um, in the fall of uh, 2019, September, we opened up our initial uh, first crisis residential program. Um, it's a 12 bed facility. Um, it's one of a kind in Bucks County. Um, there are other crisis res providers um, in surrounding counties. Um, and within that program, we kind of have all facets of staffing. Um, we have peer support. We have mental health professionals who either have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Um, we have registered nurses. Our prescriber is a certified nurse practitioner. Um, we have residential aides that just, you know, have a, just need a high school diploma. Um, and we found that that kind of hybrid of all kinds of different kinds of staff and different trainings has been very helpful in us being able to support just about any kind of crisis an individual um, could present with. Um, we do embrace DBT informed um, uh, group uh, provision as well as um, therapy. We also um, use CAMS as a way of um, working with individuals that are struggling with suicidal ideation. Um, but at the Lodge, we have been, and the name of our program is the Lodge um, at Lenape Valley Foundation. We've been able to serve anybody with high risks of suicide, um, individuals struggling with psychosis, um, individuals struggling with eating disorders, um, self-injurious behavior. Um, we've been able to help individuals that have been struggling with online gambling, which there's been a huge uptick in that this year um, with the isolation. And we've been able to prevent homelessness um, by um, securing um, stable housing for individuals. Um, so our crisis residential really tries to focus on diversion from inpatient psych. Um, we are doing step downs currently um, as a way to um, support our, our, our system um, during this pandemic, but that was not our initial intention. We really were focused on the diversion. And of course, a lot of our referrals come from within the organization and other providers, um, outpatient providers, but of course our site-based and mobile crisis teams provide a lot of referrals to us as well. Thank you. Did the unmute thing. Uh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the, the overview and, and for all three of you. So we're gonna get into our first poll question um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just have a hope as we do uh, that, um, that technology gets better over time. So um, hopefully you can all see this, uh, the poll that, that should be up right now. Um, it worked, oh good. Uh, so our first question um, is about, um, you know, who is the most capable or who's the most um, qualified person to be uh, answering crisis calls? So go ahead, take a minute. Uh, you know, who do you think is the most, um, uh, the most qualified to answer crisis calls, and we'll um, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, looks like most of the votes have come in. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to close the poll, and now I hope that we can uh, share the results. So let's let's try that. All right. So here are the results of our poll. Uh, so the question is: According to research, what types of crisis counselors are the most effective at answering calls? Um, about two thirds of you said persons with lived experience, like peers or recovery coaches. Um, about uh, you know, 25% or so said persons with um, considerable experience answering calls, and only 9% said licensed clinicians. Um, well, the the answer is um, that people with experience uh, and volunteers um, are the research has shown that they have been incredibly effective at answering calls. And so I'm going to show you. Um, let's see if I can just pull the poll down. There we go. Um, I'll show you a little bit of research behind this question, and then we're going to have it. Uh, it's going to lead us into um, our next uh, discussion question. 
So uh, this uh, research article, the, what's interesting about it is the very first line of this, of this research article says this quote here, research since the 1960s has consistently found that lay volunteers are better at helping suicidal callers uh, than professionals. Now, Laura, I imagine that you probably had a sense of this, or maybe you even knew this research already. Um, could you help our audience to understand, like, why, uh, it, um, how are people who are not clinically uh, licensed or, you know, have a master's level, like, um, how are they able to still provide meaningful support in, in a crisis call center? And, and why is this research true? This is one of my favorite pieces of research, Mishara's and uh, Maddie Gold's, her work, um, kind of validating what we've been doing for a long time. Um, and I think that the best way that I can explain it is people who are not close clinicians are less likely to pathologize the people that they're serving. And they're able to connect at, from an empathic level that clinicians sometimes have a lot that gets in the way. I personally have gone through this. I started at Crisis Link a long time ago before I was a clinician. Um, and there was a lot less in the way. When you're connecting with somebody, you have just what you're working with. You don't have the symptoms, you don't have the diagnosis, you don't have um, the criteria of treatment, you don't have the theory, you don't have all that noise. It's just you and another human being connecting. When you become a clinician, you have the noise, you have a greater sense of urgency, and I think risk really can impair a clinician. Um, the risk aversion in mental health treatment is a really big challenge. And part of it's, or a big part of it's rooted in truth. I mean, you do have a different level of risk. You have um, insurance aspects. You have, you know, there's a lot of pieces and, and your job is on the line in a lot of ways. And I don't mean to say that that's not the same level of intensity that a volunteer experiences, but you have more noise. Um, and so the connection can get more strained. And I, I think pathologizing, you know, this is bipolar or this is depression or this is anxiety, you kind of start going down that path of treatment versus listening. Um, and it's harder. So when we train our team, we do have some clinical people come into our program. And what we have found is their level of burnout is even a, a bigger issue. So you have the that layer of I've already been doing this in another way, in another space. So the motivation bringing them there is because it's their line of work, not because it's necessarily their passion. And so that tiredness, that fatigue can become part of it. And I think the other layer of this that's not talked about in this research, and I'm hoping that people are working on it, is the, the mental health workforce, the clinical workforce is predominantly white and predominantly women. And you don't have a shared experience um, when the community is contacting you. Um, you don't have the community represented in, when you use all clinicians. So for us, and you know, one of the reasons we use this research, we use Maddie Gold's research, is we have the risk assessment, which kind of tells us a story of why lay persons are better. Um, but there's also a diversity piece that's not being talked about and a fatigue part that's not being talked about. And there's so many different layers to it that um, I'm hopeful that new researchers are interested in learning more about. So that's my best perspective, I think. And our numbers show, our satisfaction numbers with our client show that are calling us, chatting with us. You know, it's always the, the volunteers that get the kudos and it's always those with kind of the clinical background that struggle with that connection piece. So I heard you say that the that clinicians tend to uh, be white and female, and that might not look like the people who are calling who are in emotional distress. Um, and then I also kind of heard you say that you have to have people working the lines who want to be there, who you know have this desire to to help and not just fit into a, a you know a box just because uh, they uh, you know because they have a, a license now they can do this work. That, that might not align uh, with their values or their priorities or what they really want to do with, with their professional degree. Absolutely. Okay. 
Great. I'm going to show uh, one more research article and then we'll um, kind of get to a question. And we've got some questions that are starting to come in. Please bring those in. Uh, we'll try to infuse them uh, as, we're, as we're talking, but definitely we'll make time at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and if you're just joining us late, yes, the slides will be available for anybody who registered. Uh, so don't worry about that. There will be a recording, all those good things. Here's another article. It's a, it's, um, this is about helping callers um, on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. This might be the Maddie Gould article that you, that you referenced, Laura, I'm not sure. But a summary of this is that volunteer status and the number of hours per week a helper spent answering calls was associated with the implementation of active engagement and active rescue interventions. Um, so having, you know, either, either being a volunteer or, um, you know, how much experience you have working on the lines, that's gonna be an indicator of how helpful you are. And that was part of that poll question. So Laura, I'll come back to you since you're kind of our, our crisis call center uh, representative on this panel. Um, uh, how, um, you you and I have have actually uh, presented on on like uh, workforce before, um, and how, like how does this is this an indication that we should be moving towards having um, more of a diverse set of professionals in uh, in crisis work um, because uh, we we need. The, we need the workforce to do it. We to to respond to the call. Do you talk a little bit about how you're seeing this? And and I've seen the, the pendulum swing between clinical experience and lived experience, or just being a helper. And do you see uh, where do you see us right now, or, or or what's happening in your community about what people think is involved in the definition of helpfulness? I jumped around a lot, but then I hopefully I ended up at a, at a coherent question. Um, sure. <laughs> where, where's, the, where's the pendulum right now between, you know, clinical experience in the crisis continuum and either lived experience or, you know, uh, like volunteer or paraprofessional experience? Well, I think we need it all. And I think we need to allow the people who are accessing this services the choices to, to choose who they want to work with and what speaks to their need. I think we like to determine what is going to help best for people. Um, but I think that people should have a choice whether to talk to somebody with lived experience, to be able to talk to somebody with clinical background. And when they're not sure, we help pave that process for them so they can we can help them be empowered to make their own decisions about the care that they receive. I think that's a really big challenge, especially in communities that have maybe public um, mental health access points that can dominate that has much more of a medical clinical model um, because it's usually fueled by Medicare, Medicaid dollars, which you know have all these thresholds. So there, there are spaces we have to operate because there's the just the barriers that exist or the or the rules of, of engagement exist um, and we have to work within them but that doesn't mean that it has to be limited to them and so you know where i see our community what we're trying to work through is we want it all and we want a hybrid model not just staff and volunteers but clinicians peers um, and just people who are interested in doing this work and care very much about it because you can't do this full time we've tried We've tried. We've tried full-time employees for many years, and it's just not possible in our industry with the level of volume, the acuity of the contacts, um, and people need reprieve. So volunteers bring that reprieve and part-time employees. But as this article shows, people with greater experience are gonna do these functions better. Active engagement and active rescue, active engagement is gonna go up, active rescue should go down with a person's greater experience. So like in a magic world, you know, we would have consultants sitting with every new crisis counselor, helping them figure this out as they gain experience because a new worker, their crisis scale is super off. Everything sounds really scary. So they're gonna act much faster. Um, but a more seasoned clinician can hear ambivalence. They can hear resources differently. Um, and they have some comfortability that a new crisis counselor wouldn't have. And I think the problem with that is people don't wanna invest in top heavy operations where you have consultants sitting there guiding, helping, supporting, at all times. Um, they want, you know, the lowest dollar, more bang for the buck kind of situation. And top heavy stuff scares investors away, scares contracts away. But that's really what's needed because that crisis counselor can do this amazing work 
but they need somebody guiding them and sitting with them and supporting them until they reach that level of competence. It's necessary to make better judgments in very high acuity, high risk situations. And and I think what when when you're talking about investment in in the system or ha, you know having like this really good and thorough training for these staff, you're you're saying that this is a big deal. This is what's being done should not be underestimated. The power of inf of support and empathy that a, that a crisis counselor can give someone, you just you can't put uh, you, you shouldn't put a, put a price on that. It's it's incredible. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very important, and people are trying to do it on the cheap. They're trying to say, "How can we do this on a shoestring budget? How, you know, we don't we don't want to pay too much for this." But you're you're paying a lot. It, it, there's a high cost by not doing this the right way. Yeah, it's going to go directly to your emergency departments and your emergency response systems, which are already overburdened. If COVID didn't tell us that. Um, and we want to pay people very little for doing this work, if they pay people at all. And I think we keep coming back to this conversation, how much does this cost? But how much is it costing us by not doing it? And how many things are we getting wrong when we're using law enforcement as social workers in these situations? I get regular, you know, feedback from clients saying that you saved my life. I will never forget what this person said. I feel so supported. Um, but all we hear about is the things that didn't go wrong or didn't go well, because honestly, it's because we don't have the infrastructure to train and support because we can only invest in the dollars to answer the call or answer the chat. We can't, we don't have the, the resources for the top, you know, the, the more experienced folks to stay and do that work. So you're absolutely right. And we could talk about this all day about how to fund a crisis system. Um, but you know, when your your call centers are not funded, everything else is funded. Um, I, I remember your presentation last year when the pandemic first started and just kind of seeing the graphics, Travis, of like when the call center fails, it just everything else absorbs it. And we have to we have to do better. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. All right, uh, Steve and Chris, I want to get you involved in this with a similar question. Are staff without advanced level degrees able to provide meaningful support in crisis service settings? Uh, tell us about your experiences and and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Go ahead, Steve, you can go first. Sure. Um, many of my staff are do not have advanced degrees at all but it, it really depends on the characteristics of the people you hire depends on the training that you give your staff um, and the whole philosophy and outlook of crisis itself and i continuously tell my staff we're not a crisis organization but we provide crisis services we don't own people's crisis they own that themselves what we do is we lend that vision of hope uh, to them and respond to their crises. And that's a different way of addressing crisis than the traditional world, which is always reactive to crisis. And when you respond to crisis, it allows the staff time to think about the opportunities and options of uh, people coming in. We've, we've been, when I first started 20 years ago, almost 21 years ago, the first respite um, in New York, uh, the constant questions I would get were the, what if they cut themselves? What if they kill themselves in the house? What if they hurt themselves? What if they hurt the staff? What if, you know, it was all these what if in danger questions. And my whole approach was never even in that, you know, kind of uh, silo. It was more of what if they really love coming here and they do better than they would have done in an emergency room or better than in a hospital. So a lot of it is also attitude and how we how we work with the people that we're serving. And it doesn't matter at this point if you have an advanced degree or, or just a basic, you know, no, no degree. Um, it's how you approach and, and, and how you philosophically um, assist somebody in, in getting through what it is they're going through. And, and as Laura was saying, it's not what's wrong with the person. It's not the diagnosis. It's what happened to them and what brought them to us and how can we get them to a level of calm where we can have a conversation and then talk about the options of recovery and the options of, of living a better quality of life. So that's that's how we approach it, um, you know, with, with, within our domain. <clears throat> I, I would absolutely agree with, with everything that Steve said. And I don't think that you, you need that higher level of degree to, to provide a meaningful um, intervention. We do have master's level clinicians um, working in our crisis services. They do a wonderful job as well and might bring um, additional tools to, this, to the table when, when providing an intervention. Um, 
but we all we also I didn't even talk about our warm line that we have that is uh, answered by a peer support, and that that warm line supports a lot of individuals and absolutely keeps them out of uh, higher levels of levels of care. Um, not needing a mobile crisis referral or, or coming to the emergency room um, and seeking higher levels of care. Um, <clears throat> you know, the one thing that I, I will certainly say is that ability to connect with somebody just on a basic human level is very important. And, and sometimes clinicians kind of struggle with that, the degree of self-disclosure and using self in that conversation. Um, and yeah, the risk averse discussion um, I think is is very real um, and, and it gets talked about often. Um, what if, what if? Um, <clears throat> but I, I would agree. You know, at our crisis residential program, we talk a lot about um, it's just as much the environment and the engagement that we're providing um, that helps an individual that it is the medication or the therapy session that they're going to have as well. Um, <clears throat> and we often downplay, <clears throat> excuse me, downplay um, the role of medication, for example. It's a part of the equation and it's different for each individual and in what that role of the medication plays in someone's recovery. Um, but being in a welcome, home-like environment where you can keep your cell phone and you keep your clothes on and we're going to trust you with your shoelaces um, is very important, right? Because we want folks to feel like, like, like a human, you know, the humanity of it all. And that, that I think goes much farther than, <clears throat> than any kind of clinical intervention. You know, I always say um, one of the number one predictors of successful treatment is the, the individuals we're serving feeling like you got their back, that you're on their side. And, you know, I mean, it's very basic. Um, and I don't think a doctorate in psychology, you know, you need that to, to deliver that and have that. It's empathy and, pa and compassion. So I want to play devil's advocate with all three of you for a moment here because um, it's clear that you not only believe in the crisis services that you've helped to develop or operate, but you also tolerate risk. You, it, at least, you know, other people's uh, uh, definition of risk. And, and some of you see this as, as opportunity to provide meaningful support and helpfulness. What do you say to the medical professionals that work in the emergency departments, work in the psychiatric hospitals and say, uh, or, you know, the 911 operators that say, we handle serious issues and people are in extreme crises or extreme, you know, states of, of suicidal ideation every day, it's on us if something happens, we have to act in a way that manages our risk the most that we can, not in a way that, you know, cares about humanity or compassion or any of those things. How do you, how do you respond to skeptics of the crisis system? You know, either how have you or how would you that really look, look at treatment more as making sure a person doesn't die than to make sure that they live? If, if you let me go for a few minutes here, I can explain um, what we did in, um, in Kings County. I don't know if people know or remember Esmond Green uh, in Kings County, Brooklyn. Uh, she died in the emergency room and this was a psychiatric emergency room. It was filmed. It showed her falling out of the chair and dying. And the uh, court system knew that I had peers in a hospital up in upstate New York and requested that I come down and train peers to be working in the emergency room and on the mental health units to help um, the quality of care in that hospital because it was about to be closed. And when I got to the hospital, I, I literally got to sit in Esmond's chair and observe the hospital. And what I realized was the staff were in crisis. It wasn't the people coming through the door that were in crisis. So in all fairness to people that work in emergency rooms, it's a hellish environment. It's not a healthy environment for anybody. And I think what's unfair is that they don't get the training they deserve in emergency rooms to provide the quality of care that people deserve when they come through those doors. And so I don't wanna sit here and bash the traditional system because I used to do that on stages of a thousand people and I got beat up pretty good. So I learned it's, it's really not you know one way or the other. It's really figuring out as a community 
what's the best way to provide a system of care where people are trained uh, in, in a way that's going to be compassionate, empathetic, even in those environments? And how do you change those environments and change that paradigm of belief of the staff? And what we had to do is we had to illustrate it. We had to actually show them how the peers were working with the, the, the people that were coming through the doors and how the level of uh, violence and the level of agitation went way down when we were you know, in, engaging compared to how they were traditionally engaged. And it took literally 18 months for that hospital to, um, to embrace that, that paradigm, and they did. And they, they, from the psychiatrists to the social workers to the, everyone that was in that hospital, embraced it to the level where they came up with their own ideas on how to make that hospital even better. And, and so it's really a, a matter of showing people how it can be done and then watching them take the, the lead on it, which is really wonderful to watch and say, oh, I, I get it now. And I think we can do it even better. So the risk aversive, uh, you know, kind of thoughts and, and philosophy dissipate. And it dissipates with the knowledge of how to treat people differently when they come into your services. That's, that's how we were able to do it. That's great. Thank you, Steve. Chris or Laura, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, wow, Steve, thanks for that answer. That was very comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I, Travis, can you help me out and just repeat the question real quick? I lost my train of thought. No, no, it's, it's no problem. So uh, you, you all are, are comfortable working in this space, helping people, managing uh, behavioral health crises. Um, a lot of medical professionals, uh, people who are focused on risk management, they care more about making sure the person doesn't die on their watch, you know, doesn't, yeah. doesn't affect their liability than living. How do you respond to them uh, and, and try and, uh, you know, at least... Uh, get a little bit of a pickaxe into their their mindset of of uh, how to em embrace some of this risk and actually show that it's it's much better for the person. Yeah. So yeah, I, I found my train of thought again. What what I wanted to say in regards to that is is what I see a lot of is the 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 things that we think we need to engage in um, to reduce that risk actually increases the risk and escalates individuals in crisis and makes the crisis situation worse. Um, and, and that can be anywhere from forcing an individual to get into scrubs and, and taking all of their personal belongings away um, to um, just not providing any kind of engagement um, or um, um, compassion or empathy about what they might be experiencing at that time, right? Um, but I will say this, um, there are instances in crisis when an individual does need a level of intervention the, um, that, that is restrictive, right? To keep them safe and everybody around them safe. I think about individuals that might be using methamphetamines. Um, <clears throat> those situations do require a medical intervention for a short period of time to um, maintain safety all the way around. Um, but again, I don't think, I think when we get into a situation where we feel like we have to treat everybody like that, right, at this high level of risk aversion, um, and we're not focused on least restrictive level of care, um, and we're funneling everybody to that same pathway, that's where we, I think we, we, we get this a little wrong. It doesn't have to be restrictive for someone who's showing up and feeling depressed and down, maybe has had some thoughts about suicide. We can't then just kind of uh, get freaked out about that and, 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 and say we have to lock them up and make sure nothing happens. Um, that actually will increase the suicidal ideation and planning um, as opposed to, hey, let's talk about that. You know, as Steve said earlier, what is your story? Not what happened to you, but what's your story? Tell me your story. How did we get here today? And, and I just wonder if we've we've um, tried to turn our our crisis services into like a no bake cookie recipe. That's like, can we get this done as fast as possible? I don't want to turn the oven on. I don't want to you know break an egg. Like I just want to get this done. And it took a process to get someone into crisis. It's going to take a process to get them out. And to mm -hmm. think that just like you know keeping them safe, removing their shoelaces and, and giving them some medications is gonna 
stop, you know, fix. It took it took a while to get here. It's going to take a while to get out of it. Um, so, Laura, I want to pose a question a little bit differently to you. Like, do you ever get, you know, pushback uh, that, you know, your that that the calls, behavioral health crisis calls, should be left to 911 or to some other part of the system? And and how do you respond to that? We're constantly proving the effectiveness or the quality of our service. We're always in that fight. Um, I don't think a year goes by with contracts that we don't have to prove somehow that it's it's a valued service. Um, but you know, the conversation that I have with a lot of people in my community is that we like to put suicide prevention as a label that makes everyone feel better about it, but we're really talking about death prevention. Um, and that's not what we're trying to do. Suicide is about pain. And yes, there is a, a, a small minority of, of individuals in you know, deep, serious mental health crisis that have to do more with what's, you know, happening than the environmental trauma that's occurring in someone's life. But overwhelmingly, the folks that we serve are people who are in pain, people who've experienced various traumas throughout their life. We're talking about poverty trauma, racial trauma, oppression trauma, um, abuse trauma. And what you don't do is take people in pain and lock them in a room. And I don't think most people thinking about it would be like, hey, I know a way to reduce your pain. Let's lock you up and take you away from your community and separate you. If we start to talk about it less about death prevention and more about pain reduction, there's a much more compassionate response to that. And that's why this work is so critical to be able to reduce people's suffering. And sometimes reducing suffering is more about just foundational needs being met, shelter, food, clothing, job, um, you know, any source of income that can reduce a person's suicide ideation faster, you know, than, you know, a dose of Ativan and hospitalization can because the problems still exist when they leave. So we talk about that a lot more than we talk about suicide prevention because that's where you get into risk aversion. But we're talking about human suffering. And we're on a COVID, post-COVID landslide of that. You know, we're only starting to, to see the effects of that. And the hospitals aren't going to hold these folks. So what is our community going to do? And that is, it really is about reduction of suffering. And I guarantee people don't want to pay the top rate, you know, 911 center for pain reduction. They want to use their 911 services for death prevention. So that's kind of how we sell it um, to our funders. So good, Laura. I already can't wait to listen to this webinar again because you just you dropped so many good nuggets in there. I couldn't even keep up with all of them. We're gonna we're gonna move into our next poll question. So uh, bear with me as I get that um, pulled up here. Okay, here is the next poll question. What statement do you believe most accurately describes the relationship between clinical acuity? and service delivery. So is it one, persons with the highest acuity always go to the psychiatric hospital, or is it the second, acuity does not consistently align with the level of care? So go ahead and uh, take just a moment to uh, get your vote in. This is great, I can actually see how many of you have voted. Okay, a couple more seconds. Wonderful. Okay. Now I know that I forced everybody into a uh, you know a binary response, either or, and so maybe for those of you that that appreciate nuance, you were a little frustrated with that. But I'm going to go ahead and share the results. Um, here's the results. 98, 97% of people said that um, acuity does not consistently align with level of care. Um, and again, there is nuance in the work that we do, right? And and so that's going to lead us into a question. But before we get there, I want to show you um, uh, the admission criteria in the state of Michigan for psychiatric hospitals versus crisis residential programs. So we have diagnosis, we have severity of illness, intensity of service. Everything that you see on the top is identical criteria for a psychiatric hospital as it is to a crisis residential program. 
The only difference in the Medicaid provider manual says that a person who goes into crisis residential must have symptoms and risk levels that permit them to be treated in alternative settings. So I have been in conversations with my colleagues before where they have said, we did an audit of our crisis, or excuse me, of our psychiatric hospital admissions and 94% of them met the criteria we determined in the audit afterwards. And I came back to them with this and I said, well, I bet a high percentage of them, perhaps 80% or 90% actually also met criteria to be in a less restrictive environment. Um, that we can't use the end to justify the means and say, well, they, they qualified, so therefore that is where they belonged. If you, if, if I, I'm sure we have many crisis providers here today. Um, in the old model, you'd send everyone to the psychiatric hospital, and if the beds were full, then you got creative, right? You said, well, what, what can we do? You know, it's going to be a two-day wait. We can't find any on this side of the state. What are we going to do? Now, in, in the new approach to crisis care, you use the highest and most intensive, expensive, restrictive levels of care when none of the other services are possible. So it's a last resort instead of the first resort. So that leads us into our next question, which is, can crisis residential programs and peer-run respites manage some of the same risk as psychiatric hospitals? So uh, this question is more directed at uh, Chris and um, and Steve, but you know, can you can can your programs make the case that you can you can handle risk in the same way that some of these other uh, traditional uh, models of crisis care have done? Yeah, can I go first, Steve, or do you want me to take it? Or? Um. So yeah, the short answer is absolutely. Um, crisis residential can certainly handle um, some of the most highest risk individuals um, that we see coming through crisis seeking services. And um, I would say in the last year, we've actually been serving individuals that have been denied inpatient psych because of acuity. You know, that is, that is the reason why either the milieu is too acute or uh, the individual themselves is displaying too acute uh, um, symptoms and, they, and, and, and they're being denied inpatient psych. Um, <clears throat> I've also noticed more recently that one of the challenges that I'm seeing is individuals with comorbid issues. Um, you know, maybe their medical really needs some um, support and help and um, guidance. Inpatient psych units are, are not admitting those people because of the risk surrounding the medical condition. Um, but at, at our crisis residential, you know, we have we have nursing staff, we and we're able to wrap that around and <clears throat> help individuals get connected to their um, uh, to a PCP um, or to a cardiologist and find out what's going on with their medical. You know, we often talk about at, at the lodge that the work starts when the individual gets with us. We're not gonna deny a referral just because they have a lot of medical problems. Let's get them in and help them with those medical problems, get them connected to community resources um, and, and provide some psychoeducation around the importance of, of following up with that and, and helping them through that process. Um, so I, I, you know, absolutely. Um, and again, I would say that we at times provide better intervention at crisis res than, than psych units do. Um, we're not as quick to discharge, we're, we're patient. We allow individuals to um, engage and be themselves. And then we're also much more careful with the aftercare planning and making sure those individuals are making warm connections, warm handoffs to those outpatient um, uh, care facilities or, or whatever it may be. Maybe it's just this individual needs to be connected with a peer support. And that's all they're going to need at discharge. That's okay too. You know, they don't need to have a, a psychiatrist or a therapist if that's what they choose. Yeah, and, and exactly what Chris is saying. I mean, it's important. Um, we do get people that do present at hospitals that uh, are discharged from the emergency room. They don't want to uh, admit them in, and, and they come to our respites. And as Chris was saying, we do provide better care. We do provide. You know, the, the home like when we talk about home like environments, you know, it's really bed and breakfast, nice looking houses that we operate. And, and 
you know, we're always looking to improve, you know, the, the, the houses and how they look. We're putting a million dollars into a house that we've been running for a few years. It's going to look fantastic when it's done. That's important, you know, because, yep. you know, when people come there, they come in with a different attitude. And even the people that don't know our services and come for the first time, they are pretty scared for the first few hours, maybe a day or so. And then they realize, wow, these, these folks are really treating me with some dignity and respect here. This is different. And they sleep better that night and they wake up the next day with a, a clearer head and we can start to say, okay, let's talk about why you're here and how we can help you and, and what you want to get from us. And here's what we'd like to get from you as a guest. And, and that's where it all really starts. It's that engagement. It's the environment. It's the mutuality that makes it work. Um, so we do absolutely take folks in that are suicidal, hearing voices, depressed, you know, all those things that people go to emergency rooms for. That's why I created the Rose House is because I didn't think everyone needed to go to the emergency room anymore. You know, so this is the this was the answer, one of the answers. And and that's what we did. Yeah. I just want to add that one of the first things we do upon admission is say, you know, do you do you need something to eat? Do you need something to drink? Yep. Do you need to rest? Do you want to lay down for a little bit? Because that's okay too. Right. And we'll get to the paperwork. Um and and that just sets the tone, you know. So. It does. And that's so important. We do the same thing, Chris, and that's so important to folks and, and uh, you know, giving them the time to breathe a little bit. That's so important uh, instead of trying to rush them through your ER. Or, in fact, it's funny, you know, we say we try to rush them through the ER and then they'll sit there for three days waiting for, you know, a placement or something. So it's really <laughs> yeah. not such a rush. It's more of an annoyance, you know. It, it, so, um, yeah, we, we handle it completely. You get instantly served in our services. That's what's nice about it. That's beautiful. I mean, it, it, this might sound simple, but it's just, it, those are such human things to do, you know, to just um, acknowledge that sometimes people need rest and, and uh, you know, w w why are we worrying about, you know, well, they, do they still need to be here? Um, I think, why, why are we having this conversation on day one? Like, why can't this person get three days of services authorized? You know, um, you take a day off after you go on a week long vacation just so you can recover. Like, why can't this person like get a good night's sleep? We're all, we all function a little bit better and can, you know, work on our recovery or whatever issues we have when we're, when we're taken care of. So that's beautiful. I want to get to Q and A. We're starting to, um, uh, just run a little short on time and I want to make sure we've got time for everyone's questions. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's go to those. Um, the first question I have is for Laura, and it has to do with volunteers. Uh, Julia asked, how do you handle volunteers who may not be properly using the crisis intervention techniques that they were in, in that they were in that they were trained, the, the, the techniques that they were trained in? Coaching is really critical, which means silent monitoring has to be part of your QI, QA process. Um, and what's really nice about volunteers is generally they're very eager to learn and they expect to be told when they need to change something. So if you start from the very beginning of setting up a standardized feedback model so that every time you offer feedback, it's the same way with the same process, they learn very quickly that this is just part of the process. It's not something that they did wrong or bad. We just want to see something different. We kind of use the perspective we want to see more of versus we don't want you to do that. So this is what we want you to see you do more of. Um, and generally, they are very accepting and there are no hurt feelings. And if you can't receive feedback as part of um, our work, you probably aren't going to last anyway because it is a constant learning opportunity. You're never going to be 100%. Thank you, Laura. And th that reminded me of something that I was trying to, to ask as a question earlier is, um, so Daniel Pink is this author and he wrote this book called Drive and it's about different levels of motivation and how we find the motivation to do things. Volunteers often run on this motivation 3.0 level, which is tell me why we're doing what we're doing. Like I, I care about the why. I can and, and that some, some, hopefully in most cases is like a lot easier to work with because they really care you know they're they're devoted they're giving of their extra time in their life to do to do this thing and 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 you know hopefully that activates them to be the best version of a of a crisis counselor a, you know a call answerer that they can be awesome uh chris uh we have a question for you that came in from carrie 
And I think this had to do maybe with one of possibly the mobile crisis team. Um, it says, why is the team including police for crisis response? And how is that working? Uh, would we not want to get away from that and use police only as a last resort? Um, <clears throat> at times we, we receive um, referrals from police officers and depending on um, whether or not the scene is safe or not might be a reason why we would consider utilizing police or at least having police go along with us. We certainly want to, in, in any of those circumstances, lead um, when possible. Um, but I would agree, um, working towards a system that is less reliant on that is important. Um, but again, I think we kind of said this earlier that I, I don't think this is a, a situation where it's this or that, you know, I think it's, it's an approach of let's match the situation with what is needed. You know, observation of what is needed is really important and not, and, and being able to observe the situation for what it is, not adding to it or exaggerating it or underestimating what is needed. Sometimes you might need a, a, a police um, presence in a mobile crisis visit, but not most times, you know, not most. Um, and that is what we have found. We have found that that can go not well where that situation is escalated because of a uniformed officer. Um, more times than not, that is what we see. Um, and certainly with the social um, unrest in the country right now, there's a lot of discussion of, about moving away from that and not utilizing our police departments as social workers. Um, you know, in Bucks County, there is a new co-responder program that has just started up here um, and it is having some success. And um, I'm hoping that that grows in the county because I do think it's a great, um, it's a great um, resource for the community. Great. Um, feel free to put in any last questions that people have, but I, I guess, you know, one thing I want to say in, in summary that I'm hearing from all of your programs um, is that, um, it, that, you know, regardless of whether you have a, a, a license uh, or a, a, a master's degree or not, like this crisis system needs empathic people that are working in it, that, that really care, that, you know, that, that certainly want to get better at their jobs, but that um, they're not afraid of, of walking into a situation that m other people just could never imagine walking into, but that maybe we can, we can tolerate more risk or, or, you know, quote unquote risk than people think that we can. And that the key towards healing and long-term uh, recovery is not um, more of a certain type of, of service, but it's using what are some of these types of services like y'all have that already exist, but funding them properly and giving them the space to do what they can do really well. Not saying it has to be, you know, that not that that guidelines aren't aren't uh, aren't good, but just to say, um, give people the space to make connections with each other, to have human interactions, and you might be surprised at kind of like what the outcomes are, what the results are. Um, the last, I'll, I'm going to do one more question. Uh, Leonard asked, the study on the success of lay volunteers and crisis call taking is really interesting. Would that principle apply to mobile crisis response or co-responder models? And I'll open that up to anyone that wants to answer. It, it absolutely does um, yeah. you know, correlate and, and it's, you know, it's, it supports it, yes. Um, what, what I'd like to mention just on the co-responder model and the police is I'm on the board of CIT International, which many may know that it's a 40-hour training that's given officers on how to engage differently and better people that are dealing with addiction and, and mental health issues. And I love CIT, but I hate CIT because that <laughs> means that our mental health system is that broken that we're now relying on the response of police officers to deal with our mental health system or our addiction system and, and not the system itself. So how do we get to that prevention? So that's why I say I love it and I hate it, but I love it because the police that we do train, they use it, they use it appropriately, they get people to safer places because I have a crisis stabilization center, they come there, they come to our respite instead of bringing them to jail or to hospitals, which is great. But that, that just tells us in the human service and, and, and the crisis world 
that we still have work to do, um, not just relying on co-responder models or not just relying on CIT trained officers and things like that, but to continue to evolve our system of care so that the first call someone makes to say, I'm in trouble, it's not a police officer coming to the door, it's, it's somebody that's gonna truly help them get to where they need to go in their life. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more, Steve. We, we do a lot of CIT here in Bucks County as well. Lenape Valley Foundation takes the lead on that. Um, and, you know, it, it can't be the answer. It, it is skills for the officers to utilize um, when they're serving the public, but it's not um, the first go-to, right? Or it shouldn't be. And I agree, you know, we want police protecting and serving the community. Um, and, and, and kind people helping the community with, when they're experiencing a behavioral health crisis. So I couldn't agree more with that. I feel like um, keep coming back to this conversation and we keep thinking, not this group, but nationally in communities, um, it's this or that, and it's, it's a linear thing. It's complicated because people are complicated. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be difficult. It's, there is no standardization of people um, and there's no responsibility that communities are taking, except they just keep shifting it, right? It's like, it's like mental health treatment, behavioral health treatment, whatever we're calling it in whatever community is like a Jenga game. You know, you stack them all up and you move pieces around and you hope it doesn't fall apart. And unfortunately, we can't ever seem to break out of this mold that mental health care is community care. It is not a, a specific theory driven thing. Um, and until we start to dismantle that, it, it it's kind of silly to be focusing, is it law enforcement or is it clinicians? Because where's the community in that? And so I just keep going back to where is the community's responsibility and the people that live in it? Um, because it, there's nothing more tragic to, as a lifeline provider providing national service, that that may be in a community the only option that we have yeah. and that we are sending scary people, scary people. Like, I'm not against law enforcement not at all, but firearms and handcuffs and police cars are scary and they're even more scary into marginalized communities. They can't be both things. They can't be the people who put you in jail and also the people who support your mental health issues and your trauma. They're not there. They have to be separate things. And so we get a bad rap at the Lifeline for having to utilize these services. But in so many communities, nothing else exists. And what we can't do is let people die. So our hands are tied in a lot of ways. And it's just so demoralizing that we keep having these conversations yet there aren't solutions it's we're going to do it this way or we're going to do it that way um so as a provider that's a very frustrating space to be i don't mean to end on a downer here but um i think it just has to be said that it's it this we keep talking about a, a issue in the front but we're never getting to the back you know the the root causes of it i'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up laura if i could just um, I'll, I'll, I'll lend a vision of hope to this what what I had to do in several communities, several counties here in New York is I, I do this thing called appreciative inquiry. And you can have, it's an asset-based community development process. So what I figured out years ago, and, and I asked the question was, you know, you have behavioral health systems in every community, in every county, in every part of the state, in every part of the country. But you, the one question I always ask is who's in charge? And, and people look to their state authorities as, well, may, they're in charge. But when you talk to the state authorities, they don't feel like they're in charge because they're not. Because it is, you know, we are dealing with the human condition and it's very, and it's so many different parts, you know. And, and, and so how do you bring it together? And the appreciative inquiry method brought the first time over 500 people together. And these were leaders. These were people that were homeless. These were people that were running chambers of commerce and, and, and doctor, uh, you know, uh, general practitioner office. I invited everybody that I could get in this room. And we went through this day, a uh, day long process of asking questions. And people were telling their lived experience stories. The leadership was sitting there hearing this and saying, oh, no, that can't be us, you know, and, and if it is, we're going to change it, you know. So you, you had these instant uh, decisions that were being made. But what it did is it integrated our community to the point where I could say, we're going to continue these discussions. 
in different groups, in different variables, and we're going to bring it all together. And that's what allowed us to create this stabilization center that within 24 hours, I can get anybody in any type of treatment that they need within those 24 hours. It might not be in my own county, but they're going to get to the place they need to go. And that was the integration that needs to be done. So it's not just crisis focused. It's, you know, a whole health approach to the individual. It's the eight dimensions of wellness that approach to the individual. And that's, that's where we're trying to get this all to go. We're just right now, we're, we're the knee jerk response to crisis, but we got to get beyond that. And you're right. And, and I just want to say that it can be done. It's a lot of work, but it can be done. And, and I, I like where we are, where, where we're, you know, talking about this today. I like where it's going. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that as well. I was thinking that even before we, we started this, that we really can't talk about the crisis continuum of services without talking about you know those lower levels of care and support that are in the community. We need more of those as well. You know, when we talk about safety planning and discharge planning and least restrictive level of care, they need to exist um, and be able to meet individual needs. Um, and and I, I, I see that as that conversation is happening now. You know, it's not just what's crisis doing and what's the outpatient provider doing. It's how we're working together um, to support individuals and reduce that individual's need um, for a higher level of care. You know, most can be managed in the community, but just really can, but those supports have to exist. Uh, Steve, Laura, Chris, thank you so much for your time today and for your insights. I learn something from each of you every time that I that I get to spend time with you. So this is a this has been a gift to our audience, and I appreciate it. I'm going to turn it back to uh, Miranda for uh, our closing. Yes, thank you, all three of you, so much. I, when you asked Travis for more questions, I almost kind of cheekily said like. Can we have another hour? And then you put in the in the in the chat how to um, register for the next session of this webinar. So I appreciate you doing that. But thank you all so much for attending today. You can see here on the slide um, there is an opportunity to learn more. If any of this sparked your interest, please email info at tbdsolutions.com and request this further learning document. It provides some links to something to read, something to watch, as well as something to listen to. So. A little bit more information to wet your whistle and, and uh, continue to keep the discussion going. Additionally, all registered attendees will receive a survey via email, so please be on the lookout for that. The survey will cover your overall experience and serve as your gate gateway to receiving more information, including the slide deck and recording from today, um, and help you to get involved in any of the supporting organizations if you're interested. Supporting uh, organizations are listed here on the slide. So again, we have Crisis Residential Association, NASCON, AAS, and the International Council for Helplines. Thank you so much again to Steve, Chris, and Laura for being here and being wonderful panelists on our first, first Mythbusters panel. And thank you again, Travis, for moderating today. All right, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, take everybody. Care. Take care.